<laughs> Play Jack. Nice to meet you. Oh, man. We are really in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> why don't we just sit? Oh, man. This is amazing. Like, that's why we're here. I'm on, on this journey to figure out what the hell does it mean to be a man. Like, part of being a man is opening up, but yet I'm having my own hard time. Mm. As an example, my dad is one of my best friends. And he expresses his love. He's like the most loving man ever. But when was the last time you like dropped in and went like, like, let's get really vulnerable together? I used to be afraid to hit with drivers. I still can't hit with a driver. <laughs> I feel like my whole teens and 20s has been trying to figure out how to, how to be a man. And but you know what, what that even and what the, I don't because what that even means because I do the same thing even though I talk about being vulnerable and showing that side I'm open to a place but then I'm not completely open because I still I have the the Sam Baldoni I have it all yeah. everything's good if I'm around everyone's taken care of so that's you that's you I think that I, since I grew up watching you do that. Yeah. But if I'm not on my game, or if I'm feeling insecure, if I'm struggling with something, I don't know. I have a hard time still sharing that with the people closest to me. Yeah. But that comes not from that comes from your dad. That's that's how I grew up, and so, so that's why I think that it's so good what you're doing with with these kinds of conversations is bringing it out, letting people say it's okay to struggle. I think that you're going to be on a on a great route with your kids. I think showing your kids and being vulnerable with them will be an incredible, incredible blessing. When was the last time any of you guys kind of sat at the table with other men and like talked and went deep like this? I mean, no, I, I, I sit and, and I, I go deep all the time with other men. Don't get me wrong. Wait, what? <laughs> I, I go, I, I, we have it's deep, wrong. we have deep Free conversations. <laughs> With other men, yes, yep, yep. But like, but but we uh, honestly, we do not speak about like how masculine or non-masculine because like I don't know. Right. Maybe for me, it's a non-issue. Yeah. I mean, we when we go deep speaking about this stuff, it is about politics because that's my background. So that's actually the, we, when we go so deep. Right. But don't, yeah, that's fine. But don't you think that like part of like that condition, right? Like for me. <clears throat> politics is important too, and zooming out of the cultural norms of that, right? Of like or social norms, yeah. it's like. How much of that also was the sort of unconscious messages that we got, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, I remember for me, uh, standing one way in gym class once like this, and a and a girl came up to me and was like, "It's like, are you gay?" In like a mocking way, and of course, a girl that, said that. To a girl you. said that to me, oh, and of course, that was you know, his condition. Uh, yeah, of course. Right. And right. I, I don't know that I remember it. I know that I never stood like that again in my life. Mm -hmm. right. You know, and that's significant. And I even think of like like the word you said that you know that your dad said uh, that not to bitch, right? Like the word bitch is so even rooted in yeah. ideas of like how we view, you know, women, right? Or like the fact that like, when we say that like, oh, going deep and then we all laugh, like, mm -hmm. I mean, in my mind, I'm kind of like, isn't part of normalizing it also like that it doesn't matter? You know, I think there, it's so rooted, you know what I mean? And so many deep things. I was never told not to cry, but I know that I got that message just from the world I lived in, from media and from sort of the social norms, you know? Maybe because I was surrounded by so much, so many women. Mm -hmm. Being surrounded by my sisters and my mom, and it's, you know, talking about your feelings, opening up about your feelings is actually a very normal thing for, <laughs> for me to do, mm. almost a little bit too much sometimes. <laughs> like where I'm like, yo, I need some more guy friends. <laughs> <laughs> How does it feel when you grow up without no male friends? Did you seek to get male friends when you go out, for example? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder where it's you got that from. It's kind of, <laughs> no, I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm gonna be honest now. with you, brother. I'm yeah, gonna be yeah, honest yeah, with yeah. you. There's been times, and I've noticed it. I was like, I need some more guys in my life, just you know. And I would you know, have a few drinks, and I'd be out and about, and I'd be like, Hey, man, would you want to be my friend? <laughs> <laughs> so, so why do we have to get drunk mm. to then go yeah. deep with our brothers? Yeah. Right. So I think you're um, you're you're like yeah. tapping the surface on like a bigger problem that we have. Why why, do, why don't we actually talk? Because at the end of the day, we talk all the time but we don't like really talk. Well, that's sort of the same thing about dating, right? Like you, you go to bars, you used to go to bars and to drink, to relax yourself and get rid of your inhibitions so you can go mm -hmm. hit on the person that you're attracted to in that, who's there that night. There, there are multiple ways we need to like socially 
excuse ourselves for a behavior that should be so natural. You said a good, a good phrase, removing the inhibitions, which is what alcohol does. Right. Mm. The inhibition to be something other than what we are. So when we're intoxicated, we can be free to be who we are. Meaning that this whole persona, masculinity, is an act. It's a mask. Right. Mm. It's not real. They don't call it gender roles for nothing. It's a mm-hmm. role that we play. You know, when men want to go out, they go out drinking. Right. They go out to bars. Right. They go to sporting events. But even if, if you just take a bar as an example, you have men not facing each other, and then you're drinking. Right. Is well, there a history behind that? In the 1970s, there was um, a survey in which men were asked, outside of your wife, who are the people, who are the men you are most likely to tell your deepest secrets to? Hmm. And here's what men said. Number one, bartender. Number two, barber. Number three, priest. Number four, a family member. Friend was fifth on that list, right? We would rather tell our deepest secrets to a stranger who's basically paid to listen. You ask, talk to bar t- bartenders sometime and barbers, they will tell you that they're basically amateur therapists. I don't think if you were to do a survey of American men, they would say that now. I think we are living in an era where just as you are now doing this show, you're touching a nerve that I think a large number of men now feel is exposed. When we say, you know, men don't want to talk about it, I think that's dead wrong. I think we're dying to talk about it, but Mm. we need to feel that if I really let you see what's inside here, you won't judge me and you won't make fun of me. How do I do all this stuff and, you know, be emotionally and be affectionate and be being nurturing and caring and loving like human beings? How do I do all that without feeling like a wuss? I don't want to talk about certain things sometimes because I want to I want to be, you know, the, the, the savior or like the the, the strength, the strong mm-hmm. person in the family. Yeah, where right. Everybody right. else is kind of falling apart. Everybody's mm-hmm. having their emotions. Everybody's having mm-hmm. their struggles. But I'll always be here. You can, I'll always be strong. And, I, you know, I'm mm-hmm. here. Right. And there's that fear of like, man, but if I open up, if I tell them like I'm struggling with something, then I'm, so, I'm going to lose that position. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm of the strong you're no longer the alpha you know the yeah and, right. and me being the only brother again I, I, it's hard for me because i was always around girls so <laughs> so i was like i could have been i, <laughs> I could have been <laughs> oh, nice very good my sisters it's not like by the way your image of me right now would be like ladies like this not it i like sisters like no but it's real yeah mm. that pressure um not wanting anybody to know that i had any sort of problems I'm battling something, you know, down about something. And my heart's broken and I'm bawling and crying in a, on the floor, you know, for three days straight, can't eat, you know, but I'm like, my family, really. I'm like, everything's cool. I've been there. Every, oh, you're just like rocking back and forth. That, that's the real thing, you know? Just yes. losing so much weight, your abs look amazing. Amazing. <laughs> and you can't even appreciate them because you're like, my heart's broken. <laughs> Why we have such a hard time talking to each other? Why can't we be vulnerable with each other? Why can't vulner- we open up? Because vulnerability equals weakness. We, we. And if you're weak, you're not enough of a man. Yeah. Right? Well, you like, don't, we're not man enough. You don't want to show your cards, too. Yeah. Right? That's, that's, that's the mentality. Is like you want to, like... Have you, the upper hand at all yeah. times. So after everything that I've been through, being jumping from one country to another, uh, one career to another, having to change uh, five homes in four cities in three countries mm. in less than three years, mm. and having to reinvent myself from zero, if you worry that you will not be able to provide, yeah. to do your role as my, as I saw my mom, my dad do, mm. this is the biggest uh, nightmare. This is my biggest scare. Um, my, me personally, I mean, as, because I said like my upbringing in a conservative family, the role of the man is to provide, the role of the man to be successful, the, the role of the man is to be there for his family and like they will be needing no one. That's, that's a big thing. Mm-hmm. We do not complain. We, this is our role. We do it. We take it as... My dad was kind of like, just like deal with the card that you're dealt. That's it. Just do your job. Mm-hmm. As, a, as a father, as a, as a career person, like, I, I never see, I've never seen him cry and, until like, my mom died and I've seen mm-hmm. him cry. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was not, not crying is something that is considered tough or crying so, not. It's just like it was not an issue. Were you guys allowed to cry growing up or did you ever see your 
your parents or your dad cry? So career-wise, my dad was a cop, which is probably the most uh, masculine career choice below being in the military. Did his posturing affect me growing up? Maybe. I mean, I got beat. I got smacked a few times. Um, but I also think my dad was different in that he was a human being as well. Mm. I never saw my dad cry until actually two months ago. Mm. So that holding stuff in, I think it has affected me. What was that like when you watched yeah. him cry? I mean, I, I consulted him, you know? I, um, I was like, finally, you know? This tough guy with this tough image, finally you can be authentic and be you. You know, instead of holding on inside of this prison, it's not doing you any any good. Mm. I, I remember the first time seeing my dad break down. Um, mm. It was my parents' divorce, and so that the fact that that was kind of breaking down was one hard to understand for myself, but also to see my father, who's always been very sort of strong in his beliefs, strong in what he does, and to see him crying, hearing him through the walls, and I'm like. Suddenly, there's suddenly Watch there's no world. sense to the world, and I don't know which way is up. I don't know. I don't know if the floor is going to hold that weight of me. Like you feel like the whole everything's falling apart because this person who you look up to and who you is your safety, is your security, you know, suddenly in this very vulnerable position. I grew up watching you. I watched you cry. You never held back when we went to movies. I remember when Nana was sick, when we were going through that whole thing, and she passed away. How emotional that was for you. Even when like our dogs would die, our animals would die. So I always. I always had permission to cry because I watched you cry. But I never had permission to show weakness because I never saw you show weakness. I guess what it is, you just don't want your kids to get worried about anything. So you try to, you try to keep them from, you know, from anything that could possibly hurt them or change their world in any ways. I just didn't want to share those negative things, and that's unfortunately. I think that what I saw in my dad was he was a powerful man. I always felt safe with my dad. So I think that feeling is something that I took with me, you know, that I wanted my kids to be safe, I wanted my family to be safe. I'm kind of like the protector. And so when all the world's crumbling around me, I had to be strong and I had to figure out a way to get out of it, figure out a way to make things right. I think a lot of us are walking around like, holding our breath, tight, tense, and, as if something could leak out. That fear of exposure, ultimately, I think it's that we are afraid of feeling shame. It's afraid of, of being shamed, right? It's existential, it's who I am. I'm not enough. I'm a not yeah. enough of this. And if I reveal to you that I'm not all that I pretend to be, you'll see I'm a fraud. Have you ever been, like, have you ever been shamed for being too open, or, like, have you been in a situation where you wanted to, like, express yourself, but you felt, like, stuck? Yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. I mean, that's, and that's, that's ego. Uh, mm. You know, you're worried about what, what others would think about you, what they'll say about you, so you don't, you just, you just stay quiet. You know, I've been in therapy since I was, 14 years old and my parents have always had an open dialogue with me. I, I told them when I lost my virginity. I've, I've always had this like tendency where I, got, I hate shame, right? I hate it, yeah. it's terrible. Mm, it's heavy. Mm. And the only thing to do against it is to go straight into it. Mm -hmm. So like when I see something that's, that is, provides tension like that, if there's no actual good reason for it, that my safety is not at stake, I have to do it. And granted, I don't do it on all things and I do it more than a lot of people, but I'm very fortunate that I've always valued that level of vulnerability and connection with mm. my friends. And I've, and I've always sought my friends. So mm. when I was young, like a lot of straight boys, I experimented with other boys, right? Like, but that is something, it's so common. Yeah. And no one talks about it. What does that mean? Like physically experiment, like, I, I don't think it was sexual because again, I am straight and I never found myself attracted to boys, right. but this just this thing where, and I don't need to go into the full details, but you know, like where you just like, you know, try things. And I had so much like shame about that for years after thinking, I'm gonna be famous one day, maybe, and someone's gonna find out and it's gonna become this thing and it's gonna destroy me. <laughs> and maybe even at that point in time, it was a little less acceptable, but I spoke on a panel uh, a little while ago and I was like, I'm gonna say it here. 
you know? And that's, that's the way shame works is like, yep. if, if you keep it, you know, in the dark, wet and moldy, it right. like festers, right? And right. when you let it out there, not only are you giving other people the strength mm. to live their truest lives, yes. but you actually get to see people to get people to see you authentically. I don't know. I think that when you do open up, when you, you do reveal your humanity, not just your masculinity, but your humanity, and that's what really gives you, it gives you a lot of strength, it gives you a lot of power. I mean, maybe I'm just built differently somehow, but I really always believed that vulnerability was strength. Mm. And and hmm. vulnerability was was my power position. That's it. And 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 it's why I'm so open about being gay. It's why I'm so open about my status. It's why I'm so open about me in general. Is because to me that's that that is my strength and power. I'm standing in my truth. Hmm. We we have confused vulnerability for weakness. When it's the strongest space that we can be in, it's freedom. We look at nature. We see the tree is rigid, straight up. In a storm, you know what that tree is gonna do? It's gonna break off. One who's flexible is gonna survive the storm. So when we're all rigid, oh no, I gotta, we're not gonna survive. But when we can flow and be open, that's when we can survive. Like you can't have true love without intimacy and you can't build intimacy without trust and you can't build trust without revealing your true self. I mean, that's the interesting thing when the first time for me, you know, you truly fall in love is you're like, you're like, wait, this person like loves the things about me that I thought that like- The dark stuff. The dark shit that I was like, oh, someone's gonna love me for these shiny parts and all mm -hmm. that. But we also, Ooh. you know, as men, we're not taught that like we're supposed to build intimacy with our, our guy friends, right? It's always supposed to remain sort of in the surface. Mm -hmm. And if you show someone, if I tell you something that is vulnerable, then you can use that against me. It's almost as if somehow the sharing diminishes you as a man. Hmm. We'd rather hold our pain or whatever it is the thing we, we need to discuss that's going on, we'd rather hold it in than share it because that vulnerability is gonna diminish our, us in a way. The scariest word that a man could say is help. Hmm. I need support. I can't do this alone. I'm struggling, I'm lost. I don't know how to do this. And I think a lot of us feel that we're carrying around this secret. I think there's not a, I don't, I think that every therapist probably has hundreds of stories of this, that the classic idea that we come in with is, if anybody knew what I really felt, the world would explode. It would be like the hydrogen bomb. And the big thing you learn in therapy, I suspect, is, eh, the world's gonna go on just whether or not you see, you know, it's like not that big a deal. What's the very worst thing that's gonna happen? The, the best thing is you're gonna say, it's okay, man, and you'll give me a hug and I'll feel better. The worst thing is you'll say, I can't go there. And I will still feel just as authentic. The worst thing that we fear is that we'll be rejected. I thought I was pissed off for a long time. Because I didn't think that you were manly, like masculine enough. Like you didn't teach me how to fish or you didn't teach me how to like hunt or you didn't teach me how to- I never, I went hunting with my, my uncle once. And I had to shoot a squirrel, and it was the hor worst thing ever. I never want to wish that on anyone. That's the thing. Is you didn't teach me any of those stereotypical masculine things. I never learned how to, you know, do any of those things that the guys in Oregon did with their dads. But now that I'm 33, I think I was completely wrong. You taught me, I think, the most masculine thing, which is you taught me how to love. And there's nothing, I don't think there's anything more manly than that. I don't know. I, I think that we're putting labels and restrictions and all this stuff, and it's all built for some cultural, societal kind of rule. It's not, I think this is the perfect. That's who we are. We're not men, we're not women, we're humans. And being human is the key. So do things from a human standpoint, not from a masculine or feminine standpoint, from a human standpoint, and that changes everything. I think that's where we should be coming from. Like you said, it's gonna take people up here to show that, men up here to show that vulnerability is okay. That being who you, because ultimately masculinity, femininity, it's about being who you are. Mm -hmm. It's about authenticity. These labels, these words, they get in the way. Ultimately, we gotta be who we are. And if I wanna cry, I should be able to do it. Hmm. That's, that's courage. 
And if we have leaders like that to step out, if we have more dialogues like this to happen, we can really make a serious imprint. We can save a lot of lives. You know, I, I told you before, this show could, man, male suicide? Do we mm -hmm. realize how much mm. that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. I think it's four times more than it. Go ahead. Well, no, no. Imagine, because I think a lot of times they don't feel like they can talk. Mm. Right. Yeah. They can't open up. They, they, it's just, and, and then they would rather die mm. than to open up. That's and it. that's like, that's how, how much, how much fear there is in talking. And that's so, you know, I, I've had a suicide in my family. Um, yeah, and too. it was, that's the thing you always fear the most, that, that you regret the most, is mm -hmm. that you just wish you had one last conversation. Mm -hmm. You just had one last moment to talk to this person mm. where you could somehow help or talk them out of it or make them not feel alone or right. make them feel like there's another way out. Yeah. And it's, you know, letting people know, especially guys out there that that you can, you can. If we can come in our own social groups and have this conversation, that's one step towards a better world. I think the question for men is not necessarily whether or not we can open up and speak. It's that can we create spaces that men feel safe enough mm. to speak? If I'm going to really open up to you with the really, you know, the, the dark and potentially shameful parts, the things that I wrestle with, the things that I feel like I have to go it alone, I have to trust that you won't use this against me, right? That you won't think less of me for speaking about this. But how do we do that if our only interaction with other men is through a sporting event on TV? With, with men my age, you want to get a man to instantly go there Ask him, what's the one thing you wish you were able to have told your dad? What's the one thing you wish you had heard from your dad? Mm. And just by evoking that, that feeling about their dads. Because they will, I guess we all want to make our dads proud. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Do you regret anything about the way you raised me? I think you turned out pretty good. I'm pretty proud of you. I, I know that there are struggles that, that you feel that, that you had as a result of, of my being closed. <clears throat> but, it's never too late, you know, and, and these are things that are helping you grow. So maybe it's a good thing. You know, maybe there are good things that come from the fact that your dad was a little closed off. It's not that difficult to talk to your father. It's not that difficult to have these conversations. The difficult part is taking the time to do it. And, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily going over your past and, 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 you know, how difficult it was. It's all about what tomorrow brings and what you can do to, tomorrow to make life better for not only yourself, but for the people around you. Because that's also part of being a man, is what you can do to help those around you and to, the, the kindness that you generate, you know, what comes from the heart. It's crazy how much you've taught me. Protector. I always will be. We can't do it alone, yeah. right? So we need male friends. We need men to be supportive of us and to challenge us and to call us on our stuff and hold us accountable. We also need the women in our lives, friends. The one, one big change in my son's generation from mine, cross-sex friendships. Mm. They all are, you know, they sustain those friendships. The girls didn't get cooties in second grade. They, they sustain them and they continue, and that is a, that's really important. And the single variable, it turns out, for many men, is becoming a father. And, and, and I'm not saying that fathers do this alone. Mothers do exactly the same thing. It's called being a parent. You provide, you protect, you love, you nurture. What's the difference between a man and a father, as I just described him? The father sees himself in relationship. And as a father, you see into yourself in relationship to the future. Mm -hmm. You want to leave something for your children. You want to leave the world for them a better place than you found it. This is what a parent wants. 
right? There's nothing, there's nothing magical and masculine about this. this par- the parents want this for their children. Mm. And if we thought like parents rather than as, as men, autonomous, individual, choice, rational choosers, I think we would have a, a far more humane world, a world of much less likelihood of war. As men, like, wh- what can we do leaving this table right now? We can be aware of our reactions to things. We can be mindful of how we respond to things, what we say. We can affect our own social groups. Yeah, we can be responsible for ourselves, our actions, our choices, our reactions, as you said. If we can start spreading the message that whatever we still now define as less and weak or um, dismissible or inferior, that, that we support that by finding the value in, in all. Mm. I think for me, it's always important to remember that like, women in many ways carved out the path for this conversation to happen. Right, women are the reason that we have gender studies programs in schools, it's, and so that activism and, and all that, that that's taken and is the role that's been the sort of the the path that's been tread so that we can do some of this work on our own, mm-hmm. which we really need to, and to be accountable, you know, to the women in our lives too, and make sure we check in. And it's not just about us, but it's about how do we be a better friend or husband or lover or any of these things. Mm. It really comes down to acceptance, accepting who you are, yeah. accepting everybody else around you the way they are, trying to make people more accepting for other. It sounds so simple, but it's the most difficult thing, mm-hmm. accepting other people as they are and accepting yourself as you are. I just know that when I feel at my best in, in, my, in my skin and in myself is when I am uh, much more congruent with what I know is right. You bring more love into your life and you share it with others. I mean, I think there's just no downfall to it, really. You know what I mean? And I think that love is, is scary for a lot of guys to express because it has certain things attached to it in themselves. But the truth is, is that love really is the connecting force with everything. I don't know. I just, I just wouldn't be afraid of it anymore, you know, especially with the guys. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Well, fellas, thank you guys for coming and sharing your hearts. This has been really, really cool. I get the chills thinking about, one, who's gonna watch it, hoping men actually do watch it, even if it's in secret. (laughs) And I'm just grateful that you all represent what I believe is healthy masculinity. Whether or not we're on the path to redefining it or getting rid of the term, you guys have helped my journey uh, as I'm trying to figure out what it means to be a man. And I'm just really, really grateful for all of you. So, to being good men. Cheers, guys. And uh, to being man enough. Hey. Yeah. Cheers. cheers, cheers. Y'all better make eye contact now. I, know, I, know. I didn't uh, play me like that. So good. Nice. Nice. Really nice. Nice. Overwhelmed. Nice. Nice. You got to like. Oh, we're actually. We're oh, shopping yeah. tomorrow. Have a good one. Yeah, it's great. Happy. All right. Let's walk.